Imagine doing that 17,000 feet, wearing a hard hat, oxygen mask, steel-toed boots, wearing a life-saving vest in case you fall over and die, getting checked for all sorts of high-altitude sickness and diseases, having to pass a physical exam... You know, versus sitting That's in difficult. your office. Yeah, sitting yeah. in your office and, you know, living the life of the mind. Now, when you ask those people, when I ask Sabina Hassenfelder or I ask um, Stephen Wolfram, uh, and I say, well, what do you think about Eric's theory? Or what do you think about, uh, um, you know, Stephen's theory to, to Sabina Hassenfelder? And they'll say, oh, I don't have time. You don't have time. Like, mm. what else are you working on? I mean, she's got a thriving YouTube channel, and she's a, she's you know that's great. That's her job now, and she she is doing research, and and she's to be commended for it. But she's not a professor. She's not doing, and even is neither is Stephen Wolfram. He's not a professor. I mean, he owns a business, and he's very good at what he does. But to say I don't have time, all I have time for is to look at my own. Uh, theory and, and kind of verify. That would be like me saying, I'm going to ignore these other experiments that actually saying, Brian Keating, you saw dust. You claim to see the origin of the universe. You saw dust. You're a fraud. You're a charlatan. You're a gr uh, If I just mm. did that and I didn't listen to the critics, that would be pathetic. And and yet I do feel like there's an unwillingness for these theorists to spend a You're couple referring hours. to your bicep. That's the bicep experiment. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But do you think part of that, and the, by the way, I don't agree with this, but yeah. do you think part of that is a little bit of that ivory tower of well the guy you're talking about with eric weinstein is is a he's a mathematician he's not even a physicist so they don't want to quote unquote waste their time no, with it they know you don't you. think no, that's no. it no eric, eric's a, a, a dominant you know force in the intellectual you know intellectual sphere no i don't think that's a, that's true at all he does he will i'll get frustrated with him because he'll often say oh i'm just a mathematician but in reality, I mean, he's claiming to impinge upon the traditional pathways of modern physics, including that of, you know, uh, of maybe pre-discovering certain even foundational equations that have led to, you know, the so-called string revolution and other things while he was a graduate student. And there's documentation about this from his thesis. No, he he traffics in, in physics. It's just highly mathematical physics, mm. which is fine. I mean, mathematicians have been – or physicists have been contributing to mathematics since, you know, long before, you know, Alexander of Samos and, you know, yeah. uh, there, there's uh, – or Aristotle. There, there are, you know, obviously Isaac Newton, you know, Cohen discovered calculus or invented calculus depending on how you think about it. Significant overlap for sure. Yeah. Huge part of it. But if if you had to explain to like – the layman out there to get at the core of what we've been coming around to with like the the Kaku camp and like the Weinstein camp. Like wh what is string theory in your estimation and what is it that Eric is proposing with geometric unity? I think there's a, there's a misguided um, fascination, focus, obsession in some sense with, um, with string theory. String theory has gotten a tremendous amount of attention, and this is sociological, perhaps, uh, and and possibly because of the authority bias that's that's always present when you have a field. As um, there, there's no there's no telling how much respect people have for mathematics and physics, and I'm talking about intellectuals. So there was a famous Japanese poet who won the Nobel Prize in literature. And he told his mother, and his mother said, "Well, that's great, but I thought uh, I always thought you'd be a physicist." <laughs> you know, she was disappointed. Like he's one of you know a hundred people still alive, or, or even fewer, right? So you think about like what is the pinnacle of human brain power? It's typically a math, and I'm I'm not a mathematician. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm an experimental physicist, which is several levels down in the public's estimation. Mm. Who do you know as a physicist? Well, just around the corner, Brian Green, Jan Eleven. Um, as I said, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Hawking, you know, the names that people know, Lenny Susskind, all these people I've had on, I've had 14 Nobel Prize winners in physics alone on my podcast, plus several others from other disciplines. They're almost all theoretical physicists, mm -hmm. which is as close to math as you can get in physics. Um, what I feel is missing from all these discussions, from all these series, is a recognition that they are, for some reason, uh, putting the cart before the horse. And in my case, I call this the, the the toe before the gut. And it's it's a hilarious pun, trust me, Julian. Um, so there's something in physics called unification. Unification is a recognition that seemingly disparate phenomena like electricity, you know, lightning bolts, static cling, and what have you, and magnetism, the stuff of, uh, of refrigerator magnets and levitating trains, that those are actually two sides of the same coin called electromagnetism, mm. and they're actually different manifestations. And this is a key insight in Einstein's special theory of relativity. 
it was understood by uh, by uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who laid the foundations for modern mathematical physics of, of electrodynamics and many other things, that actually an observer in motion, so let's say you, you see a charge here. There's just a static charge that's just sitting there. You and I see it, we're static, and we see it as producing an electric field that radiates away from a positive charge or converges on a negative charge. It was convention, right? Uh, and yet, uh, if you have somebody sliding by on a train, you know, down the street, they will see that charge in motion. Mm. How do you reconcile those two things? And by the way, a charge in motion produces what's called a current. Currents are the sources of magnetic fields. So how can you reconcile those two things with the statement that motion is relative? There's no such thing as absolute velocity. You and I can't say that someone in a car, and you've had this experience, you're sitting on a train at, at you know, Penn Station, the train next to you starts to move, you're like, oh, we're moving? No, you're not moving, you're stationary. Mm. No one can tell when an observer or a uh, participant is in relative constant motion. They can't say that you're in relative constant motion. They can only say, according to me, you're in motion with some velocity in some direction. Are you talking, I, I wanna make sure just for people who are following, are you talking about the difference in what I can see if like you physically saw me running versus me sitting on the train and you only saw me sitting on the train, you didn't see the train itself moving? At constant velocity, it almost doesn't make a difference. If you're carrying a charge, then somebody running at the same speed as you would see that charge being static and therefore only producing mm. a static electric field. However, me sitting on the ground, lazily sipping my delicious coffee, I would see you moving with a charge, therefore you'd be producing a current. Therefore, I would see that you're gonna produce a magnetic field, mm. not an electric field. There would be no electric field, there'd be an electric magnetic field. What Maxwell realized is that uh, is that those are two sides of the same coin. Electricity, one one man's electric field is another man's magnetic field, mm. okay? So what's so important about that is that there was a unification. There actually one thing called the electromagnetic field. When did he come up with that? 1850s, 1860s. Okay. Um, he died very young, like it's 40 years old. <laughs> it's been, um, and then even he, as brilliant as he was, he thought that these waves traveled through a medium called the ether, that was uh, mm. rejected 50 or 60 years later. But, but essentially, he didn't understand how he could have a wave of light or electromagnetism, which he also discovered. How could you have a wave traveling through a vacuum where there's no medium? There's no such, we, we're talking now, there's sound waves emanating from pressure and density perturbations that get picked up by a little diaphragm. Pressure and density what? Va variations or vibrations. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah perturb oh, perturbations. Perturbations. That's what perturbations. Yeah, perturbations. Like, what the fuck is yeah. that? <laughs> that's uh, some of the things you can't, that sound dirty, but are not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go per <laughs> perturbate myself later on. Uh, uh, so when you think about how um, you know how these things are two sides of the same coin, the same thing exists with nuclear physics and particle physics mm. and quantum mechanics. There are people that say there are four forces of nature. There's electricity and magnetism. That's one force. Now, it used to be two forces. Now it's one force. There's something called the weak nuclear force. This is responsible for radioactive decay. So when, a, when mm. a neutron decays and shoots off an electron, a neutrino, antineutrino, and, um, and a proton, those uh, objects are, par are part of what's called weak nuclear decay. Okay. Then there's a strong force of electromagnetism. Uh, sorry, a strong force of the nucleus, which is responsible. You ever think of like, how does, uh, I don't think most people think about this, but helium has two protons in its nucleus. And never two, thought about two that neutrons. <laughs> you never get, well, we're going to see the, the Macy's Day Parade soon. So <laughs> when you see the helium balloon, think about the fact that helium has two protons in its nucleus. Okay. What do you know about uh, like charges, Julian? Not much. Assume nothing. <laughs> Like charges repel. Uh, what do you know about opposites? Oh, I thought you said light charges. No, no, no. Not like. Like, okay. like. Yeah, they yeah. repel. Opposites they repel. attract. So how does this yeah. proton, how do these two protons stick together? They're both positively charged. We would have to break that mold. Well, you'd have to have some other force that's stronger mm. than the electrostatic repulsion between two like charges. And that's called the strong force. It indeed exists. Then there's the fourth force, which you're very familiar with because you're, you know, you're jacked, right? And it's <laughs> called gravity. So you're working against gravity. You go to the gym. You do uh, what have the question is, can we unify more of those forces? So we already unified electricity and magnetism into one force. So we basically reduced five forces to four forces. Then they reduced another force in the 60s and 70s. One of my past guests, uh, Sheldon Glashow, inspiration for young Sheldon on the, you know, on the Big Bang Theory. Oh, shit, really? Yeah. Um, so he's a Nobel laureate up in Boston. He and his colleagues, Steven Weinberg and Abdus Salam, they uh, invented a way to unify together the weak nuclear force with the electric and magnetic force, and that's called electroweak theory. So mm. now we've reduced five forces down to two, down to three, electroweak, and then gravity and the strong nuclear force. Okay. Now the question is, can you unify the strong nuclear force with the electroweak force? 
That's called grand unified theory. Mm. If those were shown to be the manifestation of one single force, then you'd have two left. Guess what we'd want to do next? Unify a strong plus electric weak with gravity. That's called mm. the theory of everything. That in some sense is the unification that Eric attempts to achieve and that string theory attempts to achieve. So they're trying to achieve the ultimate unification, but wait, there's a problem. It would be like we built the second and third floor of this penthouse apartment here, but we never <laughs> built the basement or the first floor. Mm. In other words, we have not yet come to an agreement or any testable theory for what's called grand unification, abbreviation gut. So I always joke, back to my hilarious joke. Yeah, the toe before the gut. You're down. putting the toe before the gut. And I do that on a scale because I can't look down. But, <laughs> but if you look at these phenomena, why is there an obsession with this? And I think it's because of what your past guest, Michio, said. If you could get this equation, perhaps one inch long, I'm going to try to yeah. channel Michio. Perhaps one inch long. <laughs> it could take you to the top. You would then have known and knowledge of the mind of God. Yes. That's why he calls it that. But wait a second. How can you know the mind of God if you don't know his like pecs and his, and his uh, cranium? Because <laughs> you don't have the gut. 